All right, all right. So, um, uh, when this, uh, when March of the Machines came out, I had a, I set a subscription goal in my uh, Twitch chat um, with the offer that if we hit the goal, I would do a full set review where I go over uh, the cards in order of their 17 land win rate and um, talk about my thoughts on them and uh, where I think there might be something misleading or not misleading about uh, the 17 land stats on them and stuff like that. Um, so I'm going to do that. I'm breaking it up over a few different sessions because uh, in the past when I've done this, it's hurt my voice. I'm not very trained at speaking continuously for a while. So um, uh, I'm just going to go over the white cards now. So um, I'm also going to start at the highest rarity and work my way down. The mythics and rares should be pretty easy, so I'm just getting them out of the way. So uh, top performing card um, is Archangel Elspeth. This is a, you know, Planeswalker Unlimited with, uh, you know, three relevant abilities. Um, not a ton to say here. Uh, I think that it is, you know, as with any Planeswalker, or most Planeswalkers, um, it, it's possible to be far enough behind that it doesn't help you. But if you're at all ahead um, or stable, it's going to win the game. If um, Like, it's good at prolonging the game and good at ending the game. Uh, and if it prolongs the game, it just keeps doing a thing that makes it win. Um, and if you're, like, meaningfully ahead, you can just minus and get your opponent dead really quickly. Um, I, uh, yeah, I, I wouldn't necessarily have predicted... Oh, sorry, this is not actually sorted properly. Sorry. Elishnorn Grand Cenobite is the highest. Uh, sorry, that, that, that was... That, uh, misfire there started alphabetical. Okay. Anyway, everything I said about Elspeth is still true. It's very good. It just happens that Elish Norn Grand Cenobite is also in the set. And um, this is like an all-time great limited card. Um, this is a card that I value highly in a lot of cubes. Um, it's just not really the kind of card that limited decks traditionally are capable of beating. Um, since often it has like an ETB ability of kill all your opponent's creatures and present roughly a lethal attack. And then it has seven toughness. If your opponent can kill it, they've still lost a lot of their creatures. Um, yeah, uh, it's seven mana, but it's well worth the investment. Um, so then Elspeth, I talked about, uh, Elishnorn. The non-Grand Cenobite, a um, little surprised to see only a 58.6% win rate. That's like below a lot of uh, the better uncommons. Um, I, you know, this is like a card that's basically never passed. Um, and it's a card that people are probably going to like splash uh, when they shouldn't sometimes, um, you know, like play it as like... A third color even though it's double white um so some amount of the win rate is going to be artificially deflated there um i suspect it's a bit better than you know other 58.6 percent game in hand win rate cards that have a later average last seen or uh average taken at um just because uh you know, you you want to discount win rate somewhat based on, like, if you're getting a card really late, that it means that it costs you less. Um, and, uh, yeah. Um, also, just my experience with Elish Norn um, has been uh, most of the time I've activated its ability, my opponent has immediately conceded. Um, and then when you don't have, like, three creatures that you don't care about very much... Well, so the thing is, like, because when you do it, you immediately make five two twos, uh, you don't really like need to have like fodder. Like if sacking, you know, any three creatures that you happen to have, even if you know some of them are like you know, if you sack two two twos and a three three, but you get five two twos, 
and then you also get to go through the other chapters uh that can be worth it so um and it doesn't cost all that much mana to use the ability so um that part's all really good and then also the static text on it is um pretty strong uh it makes combat on wide boards just very very difficult for your opponent um Someone in chat asks if you can kill one of the sacks in response. Uh, you can't respond to the ability because sacrificing is a cost. But like if your opponent has three creatures and casts Elishnorn with three mana, you can uh, kill one of the other creatures in response to stop them from using the ability. Uh, you can also kill the Elishnorn in response if you have something that can kill a 3-5. So you do want to be careful about like activating Elish Norn into open mana, especially if your opponent has like dispersal mana or something where, you know, you sack three things, they bounce it in response, and that's almost certainly a game that you're losing. Um, so take care there, and you should be pretty good with this one. Monastery Mentor. This is, you know, a reprint, uh, famous, or relatively famous card, good in some constructed formats uh now legal and standard i don't have super high hopes for it there um this is a card that's you know a lot better in constructed in older formats where there are more cheap cantrips but limited still a pretty strong effect however it still just comes down as a 2-2 it's still vulnerable to things that kill two toughness creatures this is, you know, solid, but not really what I would consider like a bomb mythic, but still, you know, not a bad first pick, um, but not something like it's a it's a card where you're going to be debating it against uh, some of the better uncommons and it's going to be close. Um, if you do end up with Monastery Mentor, I would reasonably highly prioritize uh trying to get into blue and if not blue then looking for a lot of uh convoke spells especially looking for uh aerial boosts to protect the monastery mentor from damage based removal while uh you know get, getting your prowess triggers a little surprised by kenrith only coming in at 66.6 .6 game in hand win rate um obviously this is a five mana creature with no immediate impact unless you have more mana than that but um left unchecked with a, a decent mix of uh colors of mana available it does take over a game really really quickly um this is another one where i i think that like the nature of it costing mana of every color and only a single white I think is going to mean that people splash it a lot um, in decks where it's maybe hard to cast. But, uh, you know, like, first pick, first pack, this 56.6 isn't going to, like, dissuade me from taking it over, like, you know, most every common. Like, if, if you if you want to get into blue, I think it would be fine to take, like, a preen champion or a dispersal over Kenrith. I, I think that you should probably take Kenrith over most other commons. Um, and, uh, yeah, that, that covers the mythics, the rares. So curious sunfall 57, nine Elish Norn 57, four. So sunfall very slightly better win rate than, uh, sunfall though. Sunfall does go later. Um, they're, I think they're comparable cards. I mean, Sunfall is probably better just because five is appreciably less than seven mana. Um, this is another like all-time limited bomb. Doesn't have the same history as uh, Elish Norn Grand Cenobite, but um, it's one we're going to remember. Um, the fact that you know this recovers from anything, exiles instead of destroys, and then gives you a uh, Pretty big threat. I've usually seen it some come in somewhere between like five five and ten ten. Mm -hmm. I think the biggest I've seen is twelve twelve. I'm sure other people have seen a lot bigger. Um, this card just you know does everything you want. Uh, 
Personally, I I mean, it, it doesn't really matter what colors you are. You should play this in any deck. I like to, you know, try to get into blue if I open this, just because blue gives you the most card drawn card selection to find it the most often. But um, I, don't, I don't think that you should have like a very strong preference for that. Next up, Boonbringer Valkyrie at 54.9. This is another just crazy bomb. Um, the backup ability here, uh, giving something flying first strike and lifelink for a turn, um, just is like a huge impact on a race. And then you also have to find a way to deal with this, you know, Bane Slayer light, you know, 4 4 flying first strike lifelink. Um, after like part of the issue is you know even if you have a removal spell you can you don't really want to use it on the creature that was targeted by the backup ability unless you have two removal spells because if you kill that thing to stop yourself from getting hit by like that one swing then the valkyrie is still there to beat you up so you kind of have to just like take the uh swing that it's enabling um so uh yeah i don't know pretty pretty obvious bomb Next up, huge drop, right? So we 3% down from Sunfall to get to Valkyrie and then 7.5% down from uh, Valkyrie to get to Exarch. So we these two are, you know, transcendent bomb level, like take it over anything, but consider moving into white and pack two if you open it type situations. And now we're into just kind of like regular rares. Um, Progenitor Exarch, um, this has a lower win rate than um, the uncommon 2-2 that uh, makes an incubate token, and whenever you um, transform an incubate token, you put a plus one, plus one counter on it. And um, it has been my experience. I once took Progenitor Exarch over the Inquisitor, and um, the uh, I, I, in my games, I felt like I would have preferred to have Norton's Inquisitor. Um, I think that this card is very strong, but um, you know, I, I, below Norn's Inquisitor tells you something about like it's you know in contention with top tier uncommons um, as opposed to like in contention with top tier bombs. Um, it is you know nice that you can spend a ton of mana, get a ton of incubate tokens, but the longer you wait to do that, like you still have to spend mana later to transform those. It's often difficult to like fully tap out and just put a one two into play um i've had some spots where like i get to five or seven mana and i want to like make a bunch of incubates but really i have to um incubate one less so that i can uh spend mana to transform one of the tokens and um yeah so strong strong but not uh crazy uh, Guardian of Gira Purse up next. Um, three three flyer uh, that blink stuff. Um, this thing is, you know, an another like fifty seven one. Not a great win percentage. Uh, all things considered, you know, the average on seventeen lands is like fifty five ones. So this is two percent better than you know a player's replacement win percentage. Um, certainly fine to take. Uh, strong uncommons, even commons over it. This card, you know, it wouldn't be shocking to see this card at uncommon, in fact. Uh, Flicker Wisp, for example, was an uncommon. Um, not shocking to see it at rare either. It's the kind of card that could go either way. But um, obviously, you know, there's nothing not to like here. Um, it's all upside on a 3 mana 3 3 flyer, which is good to begin with. Um, set has a lot of etb synergies um so strong card but not crazy bomb next up dusk legion duelist this card asks a lot from you this card wants to be in a very specific deck if you have a lot of backup um and you draw this early it can run away with the game i don't really like the backup decks um so i don't think that i think that you know there's a bit of a danger with this one in terms of it, like it leading you to not a great deck that's somewhat reflected in its game played win rate where there's like a reasonable drop off between it and guardian of europe 
incidentally invasion of Gobicon, somehow e even lower, so is Knight Errant of uh, Eos, but we see that like Anna Fenza is somehow higher. These actually look pretty random. Might just be small sample size on rares, um, or gameplay win rates. But uh, anyway, the card's good. It also, like, it's a removal magnet because your opponent doesn't know how often you're going to get to pump it. And so they kind of have to like figure if you put it in your deck, you probably did it for a reason. So they should probably kill it rather than letting you draw cards. Um, but uh, I don't know. I, I think there are a lot of good uncommons that I would happily take over it, basically. Um, Invasion of Gobicon. Uh, coming in at 55-3. A um, little bit little bit surprised by that. Um, it is very easy to lose to this card. Um, if your opponent's ahead and they like play it and flip it immediately and then start growing their creatures and those creatures are protected, um, it can snowball out of control really easily. That said, this card is definitely like very bad top deck if you're behind at all like you need to be the aggressor here it's just not going to do anything sometimes you'll draw a battle and not have the ability to attack if it's in the late game the front side of the battle is not doing anything either um if you have to stop attacking it stops giving you the benefit so like when it flips you're kind of committed to um okay i'm trying to beat down or this card just stops working so I mean, when I when I spell all that stuff out, it's not that weird to me that this has kind of an average win rate. Um, it's the sort of thing that you really feel it and you really remember when you lose to it. But um, there are definitely games where you might not know that your opponent drew it because they don't cast it because it wouldn't do anything and they just have to spend their mana on other stuff. Um, so if you do take this, you know, be sure that you put it in a deck that is serious about attacking. If you think that your deck is going to be like in the business to block often, uh, playing long games where you might top deck this when you're kind of just hanging out and not battling, um, it might be better to let this one go and take a card that's going to fit your deck better. Uh, Knight Errant of Eos. Um, this one's pretty good. Uh, <laughs> getting a 4-4 four, four, Convoke for 5 that draws a couple of cards. Um, there's a lot to like there. Uh, obviously, you do, you know, tapping a bunch of your creatures means that you're not able to attack or block with them that turn, unless you have, like, Vigilance guys. Um, and you're certainly by no means guaranteed to find two things you can draw off of this or whatever, but um, I don't know. It It's hard for me to not believe in this one, even seeing the stats. Obviously, you know, they're they're telling us something real. Um, I would I would certainly see see this as saying you know you you really do if your deck doesn't have a lot of cheap creatures maybe don't bother um because you know a four four convoked for four with no other text is pretty bad feels feels really bad to have to just like cast this when you don't have guys to convoke with I guess that's the issue is there are plenty of games where creatures just happen to trade off or your opponent uses some removal. And if you don't have like three creatures in play that you can relatively freely tap for this thing, it's not really going to do much for you. With two, you're reasonably likely to get a thing, but you're only getting a two drop. You're unlikely to get two. Yeah, I guess I can see it. I still think that it's not that hard to draft around like regularly having three creatures in play on turn four or five, and this is going to be good then, but definitely you're going to have similar situation in Invasion of Gobicon, where you're going to have some games where you draw it and it's pretty lackluster. Um, Anna Fenza, Kim Tree Spirit. Uh, this one mostly suffers from just white, white isn't the easiest. This is a format that um, often wants to play three colors and rarely wants to be like really heavily white. Um, and then this is also like, it drops off a lot if you're not playing it on turn two. You really want to like cast it before you cast your other creatures. It means it's not a great top deck and that the um, double white uh, is a really punishing mana requirement. Um, since, you know, 
if you just only draw one planes, even if you're playing nine planes or whatever, that's not that unlikely. And then you don't get to cast this, and then you're like, well, I guess I have to cast my other creatures first. And then when you finally draw your second planes, this doesn't do much. Uh, Dahlia is, you know, okay. It's hard to have, like, to know that you're going to have a lot more, or a lot fewer non-creatures than your opponent, so it's mostly just a 2-1 first strike with a relatively symmetrical ability. Um, and this isn't a great 2-1 first striker format. Uh, often this is just not going to be able to productively do anything. I played it earlier today in a deck with equipment, specifically two great swords, where I really wanted the first striker. That was the first time I'd played it or really considered playing it. It's definitely nothing special. Um, it's going to not make your deck most of the time. should go late. SRAM, Senior Edificer. You draw for auras, equipments, and vehicles. It's not hard to have a deck where you have like three, four cards that trigger this, but it's pretty hard to have a deck where you have a lot more than that. And, um, you know, if you think of this as like a 2-2 with like a splashed kicker ability that draws a card and you have four sorcerers for that splash kicker or whatever, like, I don't know. There, there are, you're not very likely. You also have to draw them in the right order, even if you do draw them. I, I think that, you know, th this draws a fraction of a card any way you slice it and a two two for two that draws a fraction of a card is um not really noteworthy uh wow yeah radiant dawn remarkably bad stats um four mana four four not not what it used to be um not trivial to uh set up having a thing in your graveyard to return um and uh, double white in the casting cost. Um, some danger to your opponent, like answering it when you transform and pay some life in some mana or whatever. Um, a, lot, a lot to uh, a lot of reasons to get away from this card. And then finally, invasion of Theros. It's just almost impossible to have something good to find with this regularly. Three mana tutors that only find a specific like one or two cards in your deck aren't very good the backside is really good if you have a ton of enchantments but like that's just not a thing that's going to happen in this draft format so there, there's really nothing here to make you think that you would want this one this this is basically a constructed only kind of card um and that finishes off the rares um So for uncommons, top of the list, Norn's Inquisitor. I mentioned that uh, this card felt better to me than um, the Exarch. Uh, better stats, very, very good stats. Um, this is certainly a premium uncommon. Um, yeah, uh, you know, it's like... The the one one knight itself is like a reasonable threat because uh you know while it's in play all of your uh Phyrexian tokens are getting bigger and then you also get another two two like it's basically like a one one that draws a two mana three three um with flash except it's telegraphed um and then like the one one is a meaningful threat because of pumping your other guys it's just it's just good. Um, Phyrexian Sensor, uh, note, gigantic drop-off from one to two here. Um, Inquisitor is way, 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 way better than all the other uncommons. Um, uh, Norn's Inquisitor is, you know, a rare level uncommon, uh, you know, mythic uncommon or whatever. If we remove the color restriction here, uh, it's below Invasion of Amonkhet, incidentally, Marshal of Zelfir, and then it's the third best uncommon um, uh, next to a bunch of blue cards, basically. Um, so, uh, that, just to provide some context on what these numbers mean. Um, so, anyway, white's clear top uncommon. If you're white, take it. If you if it's in your first you know first pick first pack situation. There are plenty of rares that you're going to take this over. Um, 
average taken at 3.1. Um, but you know, that's because often it's opened by people who aren't playing white later in the draft. Um, so Phyrexian Sensor. If you haven't heard the word on Phyrexian Sensor yet, it's important to know that the effect of this card is that if someone casts a battle and then attacks and flips the battle, they exile their battle and they get nothing. Uh, this happens for either player. This also happens if you use a removal spell to clear a blocker and then attack a battle. There are a lot of ways to accidentally lose your battle forever if a Phyrexian sensor is involved. It's very important to know about that. It's very important not to exile your battles when there's a Phyrexian sensor and you will not be able to cast them. Um, hidden, very sneaky text on this one. Uh, not necessarily obvious to people that's how their battles are going to play. Um, aside from that, well, the result is this is a good hoser for battles. Um, if this is in play, your opponent can't immediately, you know, play and flip a battle, so you don't have to worry about that. And um, if you're in white, you have an above average number of Phyrexians. If you're white black, often your whole deck is Phyrexian. Um, and so uh, then, you know, restricting your opponent's spells and basically not restricting yours is very good. Your opponent's creatures coming into play tapped is very, very good for you. Um, if you're Phyrexian and they're not, it's asymmetrical. And if, um, you're, uh, both, if you're both largely not Phyrexians and you're the aggressor, all creatures coming into play tapped is very good for you, unless you have a lot of haste creatures for some reason. Um, so, uh, basically, this is a 3 3 with considerable upside, but you want to be careful not to put it in your deck if you're playing a lot of battles. Um, but aside from that, uh, I I've found this card to be really, really difficult to play against just sometimes at random, um, where you're just trying to do something that this doesn't let you do, and it causes big problems. Um, Zelfir and Lancer, this thing is pretty bad if you're not knights, but if you have a lot of knights, then it's going to be attacking as a 4-4 four, four, or 5-5 five, five, um, pretty often, and then it's very good. Um, Seal from Existence, I think this thing primarily suffers just from being double white to cast. Um, O-rings are good. O-rings with Ward 3, uh, you know, solve a lot of the problems with O-rings. Um, it becomes even harder for your opponent to, like, blow them up and get their stuff back. Um, but white-white is a pain, again, in this set where it's not all that common that you want to be, like, really base white. Um... There's a note about uh, the improvement when drawn on Lancer being negative. Um, in basically every set, basically every aggressive three drop has a negative improvement when drawn. It's just the nature of improvement when drawn. It's not a good stat for telling you anything that you would expect to learn about the quality of a card from a stat like this. Um, the reason is that aggressive cards... Uh, are more likely to lose in long games, and the longer the game is, the more like you are, likely you are to draw each of your cards. Um, and so uh, cards that are good in control decks have better improvement when drawn than cards that are good in aggro decks. Um, Phyrexian Awakening. Um, this is really nice with uh, Scroll Shift, the thing that flickers it. Uh, where flickers a thing, um, and uh, seal from existence overvalued based on its average taken at. Yeah, that's going to be true for a lot of removal, especially sorcery speed removal. I, I do. I would expect this to be overvalued. Um, anyway, awakening. Uh, I, I also particularly like the more defensive your deck is, the more you care about. Uh, Phyrexian Awakening because the more Vigilance matters because the more your priority is blocking and then this just like lets you attack when you otherwise wouldn't. Um, the card's like, you know, pretty good despite the fact that 
it kind of rounds to a five mana four four uh vigilance um obviously indexed where it's giving most of your other creatures vigilance it's a lot better and you know it does have kind of like you get to split up your costs and you can attack with it on turn three and stuff like that so it's it's certainly better than a five mana four four vigilance even though it also has some drawbacks like they can bounce the token um but uh yeah i, I don't i don't know i think this card is pretty good if you care about phyrexians and tokens and stuff but um not like a big draw to do a thing if it's out of your way basically um elspeth smite uh this is i was gonna say this is one that i would expect to be overrated but it's it's taken at about a rate that's you know relatively in line with its win rate um I have not been impressed by like three damage um like to the extent that you can try to approximate this card as lightning bolt um it seems like it should be very good obviously there are a lot of differences between lightning bolt and this card um and uh just across the board in this format i like removal less than other formats because some portion of the time you have battles that you're trying to flip and um if you play a creature then it's possible that you will be ahead on the board because you have that creature and it will let you flip the battle whereas if you play a removal spell that removal spell is never going to be able to attack a battle um so that means that I want my removal to be like relatively premium. Also, this thing has the disadvantage that I can never use it to destroy a blocker that is stopping me from flipping a battle and then flip the battle unless like there's a trample creature involved or it like lets me attack with multiple things where I otherwise wouldn't be able to attack with any of them. Um, but like the fact that the opponent gets to block anyway means this can't clear a path to flip a battle, which is something that you might want to do with a removal spell in this format. So a strike against it, in addition to just the fact that it only kills small creatures, is vulnerable to combat tricks, etc. Um, your opponent gets to decide when you can do it rather than you. Like, they have to choose to use their creature, um, which means that, you know, they can choose to only use their creature in a way that would expose it to this card when they have a combat trick, for example. Invasion of Dominaria, um, unfortunately, relatively low <clears throat> impact on the front side, relatively difficult to flip at five loyalty, uh, getting a Sarah's sweet, but um, this is, uh, I guess, you know, like, there are formats where spending three mana to gain four life and draw a card isn't good, but also not horrible. In this format, it's particularly bad because uh there are so many mana sinks um there's other things that you could be productively spending that mana on so the opportunity cost of getting this battle down is pretty high um so this is one that you generally don't want unless like your deck is for some reason very good at like flipping battles and you just can't find other battles to attack with your deck that really wants to find battles to attack Surge of Salvation, this obviously reads like a sideboard card. You can, of course, play it as a protection spell that has some extra value. I did get blown out by this once when uh, my opponent had it, and I just happened to be a red-black deck. Um, but uh, its win rate is not very good. Um, so if you were wondering, like, is the protection spell good enough to play this main? I don't have experience personally. I've been assuming that it's not 17 lands data supports that, but um, if you have like some very good rares that you are interested in protecting, then I think it's totally reasonable to play it with a primary plan of like protecting your bomb. Daxos, Blessed by the Sun. This basically just has the Anafenza problem um, where its casting cost is really restrictive um, and it's not especially great unless you're really white heavy and it's just very hard to have a deck that wants to be white heavy enough to really take advantage of this um it's the kind of thing where if you're playing fewer than 10 white sources um and those need to be like actual lands that tap for white not like skittering surveyor because then you can't play this thing until turn four um so if you have like 10 
on turn two white sources, then this thing's probably pretty good. But even if you have like nine, then the casting cost is a meaningful strike against it. Um, also, this is a format where just like reasonably vanilla 2 2 ish creatures uh, don't excel. Um, the games go pretty long, the boards can get bogged down pretty easily, um, and it can just be hard to like get anything out of them. Speaking of relatively vanilla tutus, um, this is one. Five is just a ton of mana to tr transform it. Um, when you do that, you get like a decent attacker, but nothing special. Um, just not really worth the investment. I mean, it's fine to play it if you are just like short a two, but you might be better served by just playing fewer two drops than you think you should, which the format might reward anyway. Seraph of New Capenna, another dangerously close to Wind Drake. Uh, Wind Drake is very bad in modern magic. Um, and uh, the four mana to transform it, plus Phyrexian. The thing you get isn't all that special. The fact that this is not merely like activate once per turn or anything, it's uh, an attack trigger, so you have to like pre commit to whether you're sacking the thing to it means that like the backside of this is just really not that impressive um so yeah not much to see here uh quendi suffers from a lack of first strikers to give double strike to um i think that if you are specifically playing like a white red equipment deck then uh this card can be pretty good i don't think that that deck is very good and I think that you need to be like pretty solidly there to want to mess with this. Um, wow, Invasion of Bellinon has some really bad stats. Uh, okay, lesson learned. Um, uh, th that I mean, this makes sense to me. I was just talking about how uh, tutus are like pretty bad. If you compare this to something like um, Overgrown Pest. Like, getting a five loyalty battle that you can put a bunch of work into flipping to get a Glorious Anthem um, is a lot worse than just drawing a card that you get some selection about and can, like, be fixing and stuff. Um, and uh, I also, like, when my opponent has flipped it, the Anthem has typically not felt all that great, especially because, like, the fact that they had to devote a bunch of attackers to this means that you have like a good life cushion and um you know if they had to make any even slightly unfavorable attacks the like extra stats they're getting often aren't going to make up for like a creature that they maybe lost to do it um just just generally uh you know a situation where the juice isn't worth the squeeze i guess tiller flesh uh Tragically, bad stats. I, I've actually had a tiny bit of good experience with this um, in like a blue-white deck with like Raph and a bunch of like uh, Convoke spells that target it, like a bunch of the white Convoke commons, boosts and cutdowns. Um, you do need a pretty large number. A base rate of a 4-mana 2-4 is not a very good base rate. Um, but I will say that I have... Like, the ceiling on this card does exist. I have seen games where it performs well, where it's made, like, several guys, and that's been meaningful. But, um, you know, we've, we've seen, like, on Heliod, like, the horrible stats on a 4-mana four 4-4. Four, four. Uh, at 4-mana 2-4, uh, you, you really need to, like, you know... If this were just a 4-mana 2-4 two Incubate 2... That feels like it would be a printable card in this set. So, uh, you know, you need to average more than, like, at least one, likely more than one trigger per time that you play this. And that average has to take into account times that, like, the game ends on this, like, before you get to trigger it or your opponent kills it immediately. So you need to, like, have it have not used your thing that targets, draw a thing that targets, cast the thing that targets, then do that again some reasonable portion of the time. Um, but, uh, yeah. 
so sometimes you can get there with it, but in general, I wouldn't like draft Tiller and then try to draft a deck that has a bunch of stuff for it. Um, four minute, uh, two four incubate two would still be a lot worse than Vat Keeper, so it needs at least two. Um, I mean, it's certainly like Vat Keeper is really good. So, like, you can be some amount worse than Vat Keeper and still be, like, a fine card to play. But um, Vat Keeper is the uh, green-black 3-3 three, three, incubate 2 for 3 mana that you could spend 5 mana to wake up a token and double the counters on it. Um, this, you know, it's really hard to imagine this being better than that uh, any reasonable portion of the time. Um, but I think that, uh, you know... You, you you really need to make sure that you're not playing it in a deck that's going to trigger it below once a game on average. And if you're being honest with yourself about averages, it's very, very hard to have a deck that's actually going to trigger it, you know, beyond one or close to two times a game on average. Um, not saying it's impossible. Some decks might want it, but proceed with extreme caution. That takes us to commons. The highest win rate here, aerial boost. I can imagine this might surprise some people. Uh, it only surprises me because I know that before the highest win rate was angelic intervention, and I know that because it was notable because I believed that aerial boost was the best white common. Um, I'm glad to see arrow boost as this little up arrow. I'm glad to see that uh, arrow boost is finally getting the stats it deserves. Um, I, I do genuinely think it's just straight up the best common in white. Um, I think that a vast majority of white decks want to uh, like prioritize arrow boost over all of the other white commons, and they don't even drop off uh, in like how much I want them very quickly. Like obviously it's a combat trick. You need some creatures, but um, it's you know like it doesn't have the same problem that other convoke cards do, where you need like a particularly high creature count to like be able to pay for the uh, convoke and stuff. This is this is just a very very good trick. Um, the fact that it often costs no mana um, means that. You know, there are a decent number of games where you just eat your opponent's creature for free, and that's just a really, really big tempo swing. Um, uh, really, really big fan of this card. Its game and hand win rate isn't exceptional at uh, 56 8, um, but being like best in color is notable. Um, this is more of a, you know, indication about. Um, white rather than about this card um you know given its average last seen and average taken out i feel pretty comfortable saying you know you for a vast majority of viewers are underrating this card um if you're going to take another white common over it uh think twice about it um there are times when it's correct to but uh if you're not sure just take the aerial boost um Angelic Intervention is uh, the next best, only barely worse stats than Aerial Boost. Um, I would not want to play a ton of these unless my deck um, was pretty aggressive and um, had like pretty good creatures to protect or like things I was you know investing in putting counters on, like in a backup deck or something. The reason I say aggressive here is, of course... Um, Combat tricks are best when they can be used reactively, and when you're trying to use a trick defensively, it's often in a spot where your opponent can like get you in response. Um, so if you know you're in a spot where you're attacking, they're blocking, they're tapped out, um, you might be more likely to be able to like stick this. Um, obviously, most of the time, what you're hoping to do with this is. Uh, like counter removal spell and get some value. Um, I think, yeah, I, I take this considerably lower than boost just because I want more boosts than interventions, but it is nice to have an intervention um, and it, you know, it's a pretty strong card. Um, 
Up next, Sword Sworn Cavalier. I think that this speaks more to the strength of the blue white knight's archetype than the strength of this card overall. I think that if you are not uh, blue white, um, this is going to be a considerably lower priority for you. We can double check that quick by looking at white paired with other things. And here we see like white black. Um, very, very different pick orders for white black. Well, I mean, success orders. Uh, New Coalition followed by Cut Short, followed by Alabaster Host Intercessor. Um, so this suggests, you know, white black is a lot more defensive. We have like value guy, defensive uh, trick instead of aggressive trick, um, top end, you know, two for one type creature. Then we get to intervention. And then interestingly, Bolo Slinger, an aggressive card over Cavalier because we're not really getting the Knight's energy. Um, in white green, uh, similar, you know, same top two flipped order, but uh, here we have, you know, Bolo Slinger and somehow Golden Scale Aeronaut. Uh, and, you know, um, the, the Knight is way down. Um, I think I don't even see it. Um, where where is that guy? Uh, yep, way 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 down. So um, yeah, basically uh, the reason that the cavalier is so high is that it um, you know basically only gets played in the night decks where it regularly has first strike, and then it's a very good attacker. Um, if that's not you, don't put this in your deck. Knight of the New Coalition. Uh, this is, you know, I like this most when I'm convoking, getting two bodies. Uh, it's more valuable when you can also tap them for mana, especially since they have vigilance, so they can like attack and convoke. Um, we saw they had pretty good stats in white black, which doesn't have a lot of convoke. Might be a little bit more likely to care about um, the like extra value. But uh, yeah, this is, you know, we're, we're getting into um, kind of like, well, no, I was going to say we're getting into like nuts and bolts filler type cards, but realistically, this is still at a 57.8% uh, game in hand win rate. Uh, again, like comparing that to the uncommons, 57.8, we're talking better than everything except Phyrexian is Awakening, or, uh, Awakening and Norn's Inquisitor um, in blue white, sorry, uh, across all of white. That's looking at mono white. Sorry. Game and hand win rate. Okay. Uh let me let me back this up. Common. Okay. This makes way more sense. Okay. 559. Sorry. When I just said that it was uh in, you know in the 57s, that's in blue white where it's elevated both because it's paired with blue cards, which are good, and because it's in its archetype. So across white in general, 559. Compared to uncommons, that still puts it ahead of every uncommon except Norns and Quarter. Um, so the the cutoff for yeah, all these these three the uh, Cavalier, the Knight of the New Coalition, and the Bola Slinger all do better than a vast majority of white uncommons. Some amount of the you know the, they're taken later bump there, um, but something to think about. Uh, you know, the so the Cavalier, if you're blue white, the Knight of the New Coalition and Bola Slinger are, you know, comparable with most of the white uncommons. Um, outside of the super premium ones. Uh, Bola Slinger, very good, aggressive card. Um, makes it, it's just very, very hard to block against a Bola Slinger. Um, I think this card's quite bad if you're uh, going to be the person blocking most of the time. And um, it suffers from not being a knight in blue white, of course, but um, definitely a premium uh, aggressive white common, which is to say not a card I personally have a lot of experience playing with. I uh, typically don't draft my decks with the expectation that I will be the aggressor most of the time. Um, that's maybe a personal flaw. Uh, it's 
really, you know, that that's more about me than this card. Um, and I, I'm sure that those of you who do like to draft decks that attack, you've probably had some good experiences with the Bullet Slinger. Alabaster Host Intercessor. Um, I like my land cycling cards to only cost a single color of mana, uh, or a single colored mana pip. That helps. But I also just, I'm not that high on land cyclers in this format. Um, because again, there are so many mana sinks that I feel like needing to spend mana cycling is a pretty real cost. And um, I like to just play a high land count because there are so many mana sinks, which makes it like less important to have uh, a cycler because you're just less likely to be missing land drops to begin with. Um, that said, the creature here isn't bad, but it's also like I, I don't think anyone would be interested in playing this card if it didn't have plain cycling. It's just a little bit too expensive for what it does. Um, so I, I don't know. I, I think that this is. Um, you know, there. I know there was a bit of speculation about this card being very strong before the set came out. I think that um, the set is overall unfavorable to this card as it might exist across all formats. Um, but it's you know a fine card to play. I'm I'm gonna include one in most of my three color white decks uh, where I value the fixing. Of putting plant cycling. Um, cut short. Uh, this card's quite good if your opponent's creatures are going to be tapped, meaning if they're attacking you, uh, you want to be careful about playing it in aggressive decks. Um, but I, I like it a lot in the controlling white decks of any sort. Um, you can also. Um, try if you wish to combine it with bola slinger to tap your opponent's creatures and then kill them i don't recommend that plan just because uh the cards aren't good when not drawn together in that deck like one of them is going to be the wrong card for the deck but that is an interaction that exists uh sigil sentinel um this is a knight uh this card has a lot of synergy in the set. Being both a knight and a backup creature, uh, as a creature of vigilance, it's also a good thing to back up onto. Um, this is a you know solid white card that's going to fill a role in most of your white decks, but it's also just kind of like medium in terms of like total output for the mana. Um, which is to say that it's a card that I don't prioritize very highly, but also I don't think it's embarrassing. Core Halberd, you're going to notice a relatively low number of games played compared to like the Sigil Sentinel. Sigil Sentinel is going to make the cut a good portion of the time, whereas the Halberd is going to be played very rarely. I think the Halberd is only good um, when you Arguably some portion of the time when you're very wide, but I think a lot of the times that this card is going to perform well are when it's specifically paired with uh, Rev, the red-white uncommon. It gives equipped creatures double strike. I think this card is uh, not in any way embarrassing. I mean, like, uh, you know, kind of the standard is a one-man equipment that equ equips for one and gives plus one, plus one. This is exactly all of that but also vigilance as long as you are you know playing white and uh, spending white mana uh, up front to play it isn't a problem so this is a pretty good piece of equipment if you ignore the fact that it's just a relatively small amount of impact for a card but the rate for what it's doing is good relative to like other cards that exist if this is sometimes giving your creatures double strike it becomes kind of incredible um Golden Scale Aeronaut, uh, noted when I was looking at the, um, you know, each of the different color pairings that this plays best in green-white. That's not terribly surprising in that, uh, you know, in the past there have been sets where there are blue cards that give things flying and those always pair best with green. Um, green is most likely to get you to five mana. Green is most likely to have big creatures that want to get flying and green white as a deck has the like plus one plus one counter synergy stuff that this card can play with 
you can build a giant thing and then send it into the air. Um, that said, this is a 5 mana 2-3. If you want, you can call it a 5 mana 3-4 flyer. 5 mana 3-4 flyer is uh, kind of a normal limited rate for a filler card. Um, there have been a lot of sets with 5 mana 3-4 flyers. They are usually cards that you're not excited to play, but you're willing to play them. The ability to move uh, some of its power and toughness to another creature, essentially, and also give that creature flying for a turn, is better upside than um, we're uh, often seeing um, on those kinds of cards, but that's just saying this is better than some filler cards in some other formats, which doesn't necessarily move it into not filler itself. Realm Breaker's Grasp. Uh, I just want to point out what's going on here because this is the kind of card that I am never into and uh, people often want to play it because it's removal. Um, and uh, I, I'm happy to see, especially after uh, Phyrexial will be won, where I was down on a similar card and then had to accept that uh, it was winning a lot, so maybe it was fine. It's good to see we're back to a set where this kind of card still reads as bad to me and continues to not put up good results. Um, I The thing that I was saying about how removal in this set has the problem that it can never pressure battles um, applies very much here. Uh, I just don't want removal that isn't exceptional like i i don't like I, I don't want to play mediocre removal just because it's removal um i don't think the upside is there um and the fact that this like lets them convoke or crew or sacrifice or flicker their thing like there, there are just too many things that can go wrong in this set for this card for example the next card up is sun to the gateway which is the thing that can go wrong um this card is uh quite a bit better than it reads um it reads like a disenchant which is typically not a card that you can main deck but um really this is a two mana two two uh phyrexian um it has plus one plus one counters on it if you care about plus one plus one counters as objects um it has the phyrexian type if you care about phyrexian type um and then it has the upside that it can also kind of be a reclamation sage uh if you draw it like i think you generally you know if you have this on two and you don't have another two you just play it as a two two but if you draw it late sometimes your opponent has some artifact or equipment and you get to kill it kind of for free you have to come up with a couple extra mana but um you get rid of their card um yeah it's, it's also a creature and spell as pointed out in chat it's a both a creature and a spell for Wrath. Um, I've played three of these in a deck with Wrath. Uh, I do definitely value the creature and spell to pair with uh, Wrath, whether like Captain um, or Stalwart, whether it's Stalwart, whatever. The two mana Wrath that draws cards when you have creatures. Uh, blue, white, uncommon. Next up, Enduring Bond. So I guess, you know, Showing my bias here pretty clearly, uh, the Grasp and Sunder, very similar stats. Um, and I'm saying Sunder is underrated, uh, Grasp is overrated. Um, that, I would point out, very, very clearly true. If you look at their uh, average takens, they, they win a similar amount, but they're taken very, very different picks. Um, not saying that you should Play, you shouldn't take Sun to the Gateway over Realm Breaker's Grasp. You shouldn't necessarily not play Grasp to play Sun to the Gateway. What you should do is you should be playing Sun to the Gateway more often than you're playing Realm Breaker's Grasp because you should take them similarly and you'll see Sun to the Gateway later. That's that's the experience that I've had, is I've played Grasp very rarely and I've played Sunder pretty often because I because you just see a lot more Sunders. Um, Next up, Enduring Bond Warden. Um, 
It's a low impact, low cost card. This format is not great for low impact, low cost cards, except that they're good for convoking. Um, this and Tarkir Dune Shaper. These are cards that I, you know, would have loved in a set like Phyrexia Obi Wan. Um, but the more, and it, you know, early on I was pretty high on these because we've had so many sets recently where one mana creatures were just kind of generically good. Um, like it was just really important to get into play on turn one. In this set, it has seemed games go longer and they're not, it's just not that kind to one mana creatures. So, um, these things are not uh, as good as they could be in some other contexts. Um, they are fine if your deck wants one mana creatures for some reason, but if you believe that your deck wants one mana creatures for some reason, I guess I would offer maybe you should reconsider. Maybe it doesn't. Um, uh, the, the stats seem to indicate that you're usually better off just forgoing these things. Alabaster Host Sanctifier. Uh, how far we've fallen from the uh, Pegasus from Dominaria, Unicorn from Dominaria. Um, Dominaria, another set uh, led by uh, Dave Humphreys, who led this set, um, had basically the same card, and it was like the top performing common. Here uh, we have a huge drop off for this, really showing the extent to which the format is not about this. Uh, this is is actually showing two different things. One, it's showing that two twos are not as good. The bigger thing that it's showing is that lifelink's not as good. And the reason that lifelink is not as good is that um, you just don't... Uh, the more life you start a game with, the less each point of life matters, especially life gain. And the nature of battles is such that players effectively start with some more life. And um, that just means that, like, the marginal returns on the additional life from this thing are lower. The games are less likely to end early, which means that they're more likely to end at a point where damage has scaled a lot. So it's less likely that the extra life that you gain translates into an extra turn. Um, so, uh yeah, this this thing, despite the fact that lifelink is a very good ability to have with backup, um, somehow that's that's not enough to make up for the uh, strikes against this card in the format. Uh, Fifty-two point two scroll shift. Just dis uh, disappointing stats for this card. Um, this is. Uh, I think, you know, suffering from the fact that there are so many mana sinks that a low impact cantrip um, is hard to fit into your uh, mana. Um, and uh, you need to have some pretty exceptional synergies for this to be worth it. There are some of those, but it's hard to have a lot of them. Um, I would call out specifically the... Um, green uncommon uh that makes a 5-5 token and gains five life and gives your faxians reach as a very good card to scroll shift um if you have that and some other things with good incubate numbers then you might want to consider playing scroll shift but if you're just trying to use this as like a protection spell um maybe maybe stick to the uh two mana protection spells um inspired charge uh this is just not the format for inspired charge um there are not while there are some creatures that make multiple bodies they are not cheap in white and um the uh the Incentives to play things that are not Inspired Charge as your non-creature spells are very high. Um, there are cheaper, more efficient combat tricks, there are Convoke spells, there are battles, um, and those are all fighting for the same space in your deck as Inspired Charge, um, because they all need you to have creatures in play. And so uh, you're worse off if 
the thing that you're playing in like that space in your deck is an inspired charge than if it's like a strong battle or a convoke card or something like that. Or Kithkin Billy Rider. Um, this is another one that I think can be good with very specific other cards like the Great Sword. Arguably, you're throwing good money after bad there, where you're playing multiple t bad cards to try to make a good card. Um, I do think that you're putting yourself in a weak archetype, but the synergy between them is very high. Um, for the most part, you're probably best just staying out of it, though. Attentive Skywarden. Uh, the only time I like this card is in white, black, Phyrexian, uh, specifically the curve of Attentive Skywarden into the uncommon white, black enchantment that gives Phyrexians plus one, plus one, and incubates, uh, makes this a 3-3 flyer that immediately uh, gives you a 3-3 on the ground. Um, I have played this card in decks with like three copies of that enchantment. Uh, this can happen because white, black is the weakest uh worst performing color pair and sometimes those cards go late um so if you end up in a very open white black seat this is a playable card despite its overall very poor stats uh do not put this card in decks that don't regularly have incubator tokens for it to wake up and even then you might not want it if you don't you know care about it being a Phyrexian. and last up Infected Defector. Uh, I have played this card in a white-black deck that was, you know, all about Phyrexians and grindy and really liked the idea of a creature that gives me some value and stuff. Don't. It was horrible even in that deck. Um, you know, with, with the Skyward, and I was saying, you know, if the stars align and you have the exact right situation, this is a playable card. Uh, Infected Defector is not really really just don't don't touch this one um and that is the end of the white cards and as i don't want to destroy my voice any further than that is also the end of this session of card reviewing and also my stream uh thanks for hanging out everyone um i will be back tomorrow for uh more streaming and more of this set review um, I will be putting this set review on YouTube, as you already know, if you're watching this on YouTube, uh, there will be um, more to come. Uh, I, I will be doing the full set. Um, I'm not sure that I'll get to all of it this week because I am uh, leaving to go to MagicCon, um, uh, but I'm, I'll get to as much as I can and finish it up next week. Um, thanks for hanging out. Have a good night, and I'll see everyone tomorrow. Bye.